All right, y'all. This is one that's taken me a couple of couple of weeks, but really it's been four years in the making. I had uh, wanted to release this on episode 300 just for the the grandiosity of it being episode 300. And, uh, you know, I wasn't ready to release it for many reasons I'll dive into, but alchemy being one of them, understanding, integration. Um, and really, who better than Daniel Griffith, especially with everything I've been tracking with regards to Mother Nature, our role in it, and how we work with that. Uh, Daniel Griffith was the perfect for 300. But 301, still a fucking good number. And um, get to talk uh, really about the alchemy the last four years. And, you know, it's important to state that not everything from my experience is shared on these podcasts for a number of reasons. First and foremost, uh, some of it is for me. Some of it is for my family. And all of it that I want to share, to be perfectly honest, it's very challenging to get it all out because it's hard to fucking track it all. (laughs) And I have notes and highlighted quotes and an outline and all sorts of shit. And I'm still going to leave shit off the table just because that's, that's how it works. Um, yeah, that's how it works. I'll do podcasts with other people and I'll have an idea of what I want to talk about sometimes. And I won't get to that idea and it'll still be a good podcast. So I'm confident that there will be some good medicine in this podcast for all of us, myself included, as uh, speaking about this as a part of integration and part of harmonizing it and understanding it differently for myself. Uh, But yeah, we're going to talk about my recent journey to Soltara. And um, it's been four years since I went, you know, last time I went was 2019 with my wife and her boyfriend at the time, Christian and Miss Caitlin. And uh, I'm sure you can hear my little girl in the background right now going off. (laughs) Um, It was a big part of our 2019 experience was getting her called in. Um, and she's here now, so you might hear her in the background outside of my office, the studio. Totally cool. Hopefully it doesn't piss you off, but that's a part of the deal. That's dad podcasting in the other room while the kids play. All right. We're going to jump right into this stuff. And, uh, the general outline of this is plant medicines at large. What does that mean? It means the general conversation that's happening right now in the zeitgeist amongst influencers and people who have experience with the medicine and people who don't have experience about the medicine. Everyone seems to be weighing in right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Names will be named (laughs) if they've been fucking acting out of turn or speaking, and I will do my best to highlight the truth in their commentary. Uh, And what else? Uh, I will quote some of my favorite people and talk about that. I'm going to get into my experience, which is... uh, really the only thing that that I can speak to here authentically, even though I've got opinions on everything else, as we all do. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about the alchemy of that experience. We'll talk a little bit about the world at large, bizarro world for (laughs) y'all aren't Superman references or Seinfeld. I haven't seen the Seinfeld reference from Superman on bizarro world. Um, We'll dive a little bit into that. We'll talk nature, and then I'll leave you with a bunch of books that have been absolutely phenomenal for me. Um, Some of which I mentioned in the last episode with Daniel Griffith. Uh, books by Daniel Quinn, things like that, Martine Prechtel. And um, yeah, hope this hope this uh, gives y'all a little something, something. There are many ways that you can support this show. First and foremost, share it with a friend who you think will enjoy the show. Uh, also, leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or iTunes and just tell us one or two ways in which the show has helped you out in life. And... Um, With that, leave your Instagram handle, Twitter, whatever it is. That way we can reach out to you. Organifi all year long is going to be hooking you guys up with my favorite product from Organifi for the winner. Um, And it's not luck. It's not happenstance. It's not a coin flip. It is just the best review, period. Um, You leave us a really good review, and then you're entered to win. Simple as that. Uh, And Organifi will hook you up. So leave us your handle via social media. That way we can reach out to you and get you your free product from Organifi. They've been one of my longest sponsors and they're incredible. Last but not least, check out these show sponsors because they make this show fiscally possible. They are incredible. I have hand-selected them. And if I have not hand-selected them, all of these I've hand-selected. But if there is someone that I haven't hand-selected, it's because my team, which knows me inside and out, has said, hey, I think you should check these guys out. And I check them out. And they're awesome. The, uh, the way you know they're awesome is they've made it onto the show. If they're not awesome, they do not make it on as a sponsor. 
these guys are absolutely awesome. Uh, we had Mario from Onalema Water on the podcast, and I was absolutely blown away by, by a lot of the science behind this. I've been working with the Onalema uh, Structured Water Stick for some time now and absolutely find it phenomenal. So check these guys out, coherent-water.com. Are you ready to unlock the true potential of your body and mind? Introducing Onalema Coherent Water, a revolutionary new way to improve your health and well-being. Onalema has been clinically proven to significantly increase ATP levels, the mitochondrial energy of your body. ATP is directly responsible for powering the majority of cellular processes in all living beings. Increased ATP levels results in improved athletic performance, enhanced cognitive function, improved cardiovascular health, and positively affect almost every area of human health. Furthermore, drinking Onalema water improves the state of your microbiome. This leads to improved digestion, enhanced immune function, reduced inflammation, improved mental health, and finally, a reduction in risk of most chronic diseases. Imagine having more energy, a healthier gut, a clearer mind, and a youthful body. With Onalema water, it all stops being a dream. Take the first step towards unlocking your true potential. Try Onalema water and revolutionize your life. Visit coherent-water.com. Every purchase comes with a 100% money-back guarantee, so you can literally taste the difference risk-free. Coherent-water.com. That is C-O-H-E-R-E-N-T-W-A-T-E-R.com. Join the water revolution. Again, I absolutely love these guys. I got a whole house unit. I haven't thrown it on yet because I'm throwing it on at the farmhouse that we are currently under construction with. So stay tuned for that. But these guys are doing really cool things. That podcast will blow your mind with Mario from Onalema Water. Um, I'm really looking into the science of this and how it correlates, not just to humans, but how it correlates to the soil and plant health as we have a 400 fruit and nut tree food forest with a thousand plants total in the ground and how it impacts our animals and everything else. So please stay tuned for that. I will keep you guys updated in those regards, but Onalema Water, check them out. They are incredible. And don't forget to use code KKP for 10% off. Onalema Water is at coherent-water.com. Use code KKP for 10% off. We're also brought to you today by my longtime sponsor, Organifi.com slash KKP. These guys are absolutely incredible. Don't forget to use code KKP for 20% off everything in the store. Uh, Again, leave us a five-star rating with one or two ways the show's helped you out in life and your Instagram or Twitter handle or whatever you're on, and we will find you and hook you up. If you don't want to wait for that, I recommend you don't. Simply go to Organifi.com slash KKP and grab a sunrise to sunset kit to be covered with red, green, and gold and take 20% off using code KKP. I absolutely love this. This is the way that you just cover all the bases, basically. The green is phenomenal. It's got uh, very high levels of ashwagandha in it and many of other medicines and adaptogens that help balance you. If you're highly caffeinated, type A, go get shit done, it's very important that you balance the nervous system. And ashwagandha is phenomenal at doing that. It also tastes incredible. It's an excellent way to get some greens in your diet. And there's less than three grams, three grams of carbohydrates per serving, which is very important. If anybody that's done a lot of the juicing fad and gotten into uh, celery and all the other things, sure, there's benefits there, but oftentimes to make them tasty, you're going to end up drinking a lot of sugar, and that's not good on the gut. Um, The Organifi Red is phenomenal. There is Cordyceps Synesis and other nitrogen-boosting, enhancing qualities of the red that help you get a pump and keep a pump and feed more oxygen and nutrients to the cells while you're working out while you're in the bedroom, or just while you're plugging away at the office and need more blood flow and oxygen to the brain. The gold is an excellent way to unwind at the end of the night. We like doing it high fat. We typically use some coconut cream or some raw milk, warm it up, and then throw in a scoop of the gold, mix it with a little hand whisker, and that's an excellent way with with a fat dose of lemon balm extract to simply just go, ah, all right, chill time. The workday's over. Now it's time to slide into the fall before I fall asleep in the winter and just relax my way to a lovely evening featuring all of Organifi's wonderful products, the Sunrise to Sunset Kit. Check it out, Organifi.com slash KKP and use KKP at checkout for 20% off. We're also brought to you today by PaleoValley.com. Use the discount code Kyle for 15% off everything in the store. Paleo Valley has been one of my mainstays. Every time I go to travel and we're getting ready to head to Montana for our second core event for Fit for Service, uh, hunting trips, pretty much anywhere where I know I'm going to be, or even at the farm if I know I'm going to be gone all day, Paleo Valley beef sticks are my snack of choice. Their beef sticks are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished. Many on the market claim grass-fed, but they're actually finished on grains. They source their beef from small domestic farms in the United States. They use real organic spices to flavor their beef sticks versus conventional spices that are sprayed with pesticides or other natural flavors. 
often made from GMO corn. They ferment their beef sticks, which creates naturally occurring probiotics, which are great for gut health. This is super important if you're eating dehydrated foods. You want to have something that's going to help you move that through your body. It takes a little bit more energy when you have a dehydrated food because your body has to rehydrate it to break it down. They taste amazing and are a great protein snack to grab on the go. This is one of the things where I know that this is something that can fill me up. It can keep me going. It's going to give me energy. And I'm uh, whether I'm keto or carnivore or any other thing, I can fit it into my diet and I'm not worried about consequences, right? A lot of times when I'm grabbing snacks, I'm asking myself, am I going to feel good for having this or not? Is this really what I want to do right now? Does this leave me more whole than when I started? And all those questions are answered the second I grab one of Paleo Valley's beef sticks. I know it inside and out. I know how I'm going to feel. My favorite flavor by far is the jalapeno, but they've got garlic summer sausage. They have a maple bacon pork product too. That is a fucking game changer. I promise you, you will not eat one. You will eat many. So grab a number of these guys. They have much higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, glutathione, the master antioxidant, CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, which is the fat that burns fat, of course, bioavailable protein, and as I mentioned, keto-friendly and a great protein-rich snack to grab on the go. Visit paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com and use discount code Kyle for 15% off everything in the store. Last but not least, we're brought to you by my longtime homies at Bioptimizers and their phenomenal product, magbreakthrough.com slash Kingsboo. Magnesium Breakthrough is an essential, critical supplement that I, I basically put any, any and all of my clients on. My entire family takes it. It is absolutely incredible. Uh, sometimes I wake up exhausted and ruins my productivity for the day. This is absolutely true. And the longer it takes me to fall asleep at night, the more stressed out I get about being exhausted the, ne- exhausted the next day. This is true because we have a two-year-old that's about to turn three who will wake us up at any moment. And because I want to help mom, uh, I'm the one that goes downstairs to make her a baba. And that can be pretty troubling falling back asleep sometimes. And of course, I will think about all the shit that I have to do the next day while I'm on less sleep and up from say three until four or four until six or whatever the timeline is. And, uh, And what's great is ever since I started adding magnesium breakthrough to my nightly routine, I've been able to quiet my mind and get the best sleep ever. It doesn't mean I don't wake up and have a time up for an hour or two. I will take another one of the magnesium breakthrough. Two is typically the dose. Sometimes I'll have three, but I'll have another one. And if I'm up for the two hours, I feel much calmer, even though I have to be up for two hours in the middle of the night, reading books and doing the things necessary to get her to go back to sleep in my arms. And when I do that, I don't have trouble falling back asleep. Even if it takes an hour of reading to be able to go back to sleep, that allows me to go back to sleep. It also gives moms the rest that she needs. And that seems to be working very well. Magnesium Breakthrough is the best because unlike other magnesium supplements that might be giving you one to two forms of magnesium, Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium designed to help calm your mind and help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Again, if I got to take this in the middle of the night because I'm up with with our little girl, it's really nice that I'm not going to feel groggy from taking it. It's simply helping my body operate at a different level. It's helping me to relax. It's calming the nervous system. Over 75% of the population is magnesium deficient. And what most people don't know is that even if they're taking a magnesium supplement, they're still deficient because they're not getting all seven forms. Magnesium breakthrough is the ultimate way to give your body all seven forms in one supplement. Not only does magnesium breakthrough help you sleep better, It also helps calm your mind and allows you to feel grounded and relaxed during the day, especially before bed. And I'll say right now, especially during the middle of the night. In addition to experiencing relaxed sleep, Magnesium Breakthrough also helps improve digestion, support muscle recovery, and support healthy bone density. Most magnesium supplements are proven to be ineffective because they only contain one to two forms of magnesium. Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium to help you have a relaxed response to stressful situations. Don't miss out on the most relaxing sleep ever with Magnesium breaks, Breakthrough. For an exclusive offer for my listeners, go to magbreakthrough.com slash kingsboo and use promo code KINGSBOO in all caps K-I-N-G-S-B-U during checkout to save 10%. All right, y'all. Now we're on. <laughs> Thank you to my sponsors for sponsoring the show. Um, truly just awesome, awesome to be able to do this for a living and uh, have the the support that I do and to have such great companies in support of what I do because they're absolutely incredible. And they they do work. That's that's first and foremost. All right. We've got uh, we've got some quotes here that um, that have been 
percolating through my mind, uh, one of which has been percolating through my mind for the last four years, as I mentioned. Um, actually, let me talk about where I get this from. There is a beautiful medicine woman who has come to our events at Fit for Service. Her name is Waira. It means the wind. And um, she is a medicine woman from Ecuador. She's also a singer. You can look her up on Spotify. And she's taught some singing workshops. She's also performed for us. And we've had the fortune of having her pour sweat lodge for us. And she is just, just an incredible, incredible person. Um, she talks a lot about four-year cycles. And, you know, different indigenous communities participate in those four-year cycles. My brother, Porangi, is doing, uh, I think he's, he might be finished now. It's been a minute since he started. But a four-year cycle with the Sundance, with the Lakota. And in that, you sit every year. One year is four years. That's one cycle. So he goes to Sundance four years straight to complete that cycle. And not just in North America, but in South America and Central America, and likely in many other places in the world, there seems to be some um, thread uh, that connects these four-year cycles. So if I look back, the reason it's coming up for me is because the last time I went to Sultara was the last time I, I got to sit with ayahuasca. And that was 2019. And it was a very different time in my life. Um, really, really working as hard as I can to get our little girl into the picture. Um, working as hard as I can to have alchemy in an open relationship. And finally, I feel that now. And even we're not open anymore, as many of you know. But um, still very much, um, you know, have formed a tribe around what we did there. And uh, there's a lot of beauty in that. As far as the medicine experience is concerned, I've had some fucking deep, deep, deep dives in between uh, those ayahuasca experiences. I've had 30 grams of psilocybin mushrooms. I talked about that. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. I had my dark night of the soul with 5-MeO-DMT that switched on and would not turn off for 17 nights straight until uh, my mentor and brother Paul Check was able to walk me through a closing ceremony that allowed me to sleep again and return to some sense of self and sanity. If you've been following the podcast long enough, uh, <laughs> either one of those experiences has been jarring enough to need some alchemy from. And I finally feel after four years and with the work of ayahuasca that I was able to have that. Um, so uh, there's going to be a lot of shit I say on this podcast today that is out there. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't imagine that this is a podcast. If you have rel religious affiliation or thoughts on spirit, there may be some alignment in some of the things that I say. And there's likely going to be some shit that, that, that either doesn't resonate or it's out there. That's fine. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But one of the quotes that Paul always mentions is, in order to know God, one must first become a heretic. It's from Rumi. Uh, I think it's from Rumi. I didn't find that online as I searched for Rumi quotes and, and punched that in. So I'm maybe misquoting just to start this fucking podcast off, and that's fine. Um, but this has been one that I, that I have thought about, and I have thought about because of my larger experiences and deeper dives. And with that, uh, you know, again, uh, all of this comes down to my own personal experience. There's a great quote that Dr. Dan Engel, who was, who was with us at Sultara, um, and I can't remember the name of the person who quoted it, but it's, share the gospel with everyone. And when necessary, only when necessary, use words. This is full resonance for me. Absolutely full resonance. And because it's a podcast, uh, I'm forced to use words here. I'm forced to use words for myself and for the listener. And I'll do my best. But remember, uh, the words pale in comparison to the experience. And I'll, I'll touch more on that here as I get into the plant medicine picture at large, psychedelics, that kind of shit. Another quote that I recently heard um, at a running workshop with Dr. Romanoff um, from the Pose Method. This is excellent. If you're interested in, in um, if you want to run pain-free, check out Pose Method. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but one of the things he said is, pain is the penalty for violating the laws of nature. It's a Chinese proverb from 600 BC. Pain is the penalty for violating the laws of nature. And that too contained a lot of resonance. Uh, what do I mean by that? It means like there's a recognition of the truth in that statement. And I think it is quite apropos as we begin to look at, uh, finally in this talk, you know, I'm going to go through plant medicines at large, my experience, alchemy, which is ongoing, uh, not a finished thing, bizarro world. That's where we'll be talking about what I see in the world, the bizarro world. Uh, pain is the penalty for violating the laws of nature. That fucking totally applies there. And nature. We're going to talk nature and then we're going to talk books. So 
hold on to some of these ideas as we keep moving through. And, you know, if there's some stuff that feels over the head, we can most certainly, uh, some of these books will really help with that. And what I'm going to do here is copy one more book for the bottom for my book list. That way we get to see uh, some, of the, some of the ideas that I've been working with here in my own personal experiences. All right, conversation of plant medicine in general. Um, you know, anybody that's heard me talk about this, I usually say the same shit everyone needs to hear because you need to hear it. Oh, it's not for everyone. And, you know, you shouldn't do it if you've got X, Y, and Z wrong with you and blah, 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 disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, and all that stuff still holds true. It all does. Um, what I'm seeing now, though, in particular that's different is people with influence, you know, big followings online, authors, things like that, um, going out of their way to, to kind of paint it in a bad light, paint the movement in a bad light, whatever you want to call that. Um, and these are often people with very little experience or very little understanding through their experiences of what's actually happening. So here's where I get to name names because it's pointless to, and, and there's some people, I have a friend who I'm going to talk about. Well, I, I won't name names, but for sure he knows exactly. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you read it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here and that's fine. And then what I'm going to try to do as I, as I talk about these things is also try to see the truth in what they're saying. So first we start with Diamond Dave Asprey. Dave Asprey, the bulletproof guy, um, made a post to... My, one of my closest friends, Aubrey Marcus, it started with poor Aubrey Marcus, poor Aubrey Marcus. And I'll paraphrase, you know, but why does this guy need to do hundreds of ayahuasca ceremonies and blah, blah, blah. He must be really messed up. Now, the funny thing is, because uh, Aubrey's Aubrey just finished his 30th along with my 30th and we're very much infants in the space. I have no problem saying that. Uh, Dennis McKenna and... Gabra Mate, two of two leaders in the field of, of, of this resurgence are very much, they'll say the same thing. They feel like infants in the arms of ayahuasca and they have hundreds of journeys. Why do you keep doing it? Why would you keep doing it? Uh, it's not just for healing, right? There are healing components to that. And I've had some of my greatest healing work with ayahuasca. Um, but it's also because it's, it's a, a reconnection. It's a reconnection to something greater than myself. It is, and this is me speaking per, uh, personally, not speaking on behalf of Aubrey. I keep doing it because I keep learning new things about myself and, and new ways in which to interact with the world. And that's enough for me. That's enough for me. It doesn't mean that I'm going to go back to the wishing well every month as I once did first starting out. It means that when I'm ready, when I feel the deep calling, that I'm going to go back. And that was four years in between. I made a promise that I wasn't going to leave my kids while our little girl was under three. I made it pretty damn close, and she's fairly advanced. So I feel like we have a three-year-old now, even though we're a couple months away. And um, you know, unless I was working, I didn't want to leave. And this felt like the right time to go. So it was. Um, Dave famously wrote about ayahuasca after sitting with it one night stateside. Now. Everyone's got an opinion. Nothing wrong with that per se. But to claim to have the answers behind what that experience is from one journey, um, it, it doesn't resonate. It really doesn't. And I, I think he has had more, more journeys since then. But let's paint the picture that he's correct. If Aubrey was going hundreds of times to do plant medicines for healing work, is that the right move to call someone out and say, poor Aubrey Marcus? Like... Poor person who was fucking held in sex slavery for 15 years at the first 15 of the 15 years of their life who has to keep doing ayahuasca. If there was truth in that statement, that would be fucked up to lay that out there. So again, not exactly the way to go with this. Um, and, and I'll keep shifting here. I don't need to spend too much time on Dave. I know Aubrey's going to get him when he writes his book and that's fair enough. Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday has built a career on uh, recycled information from Marcus Aurelius and the other Stoic philosophers, and he's done it in a very good way, right? Like uh, people like his work, I like his work. I'm not shitting on that just because he's you know recycling, regurgitating, or repackaging. He's done a very good job that makes it makes it more approachable, right? And that's why he's built a following and. Nothing wrong with that. I don't think Ryan Holiday has any experience with plant medicines. I could be wrong there, but he made a post on Instagram while we were in, while we were we were at Soltara, and again, like, oh, why, why are you looking at X, Y, and Z? Well, people send us shit. 
people send us a, a, a clip and they say, check this out. What do you think? And part of the alchemy of my experience was in seeing what was happening in the world while I was there. And that's going to be fairly important as I dive into Bizarro World because shit that's more important than Ryan Holiday was coming up. And this is not a knock on Ryan Holiday, but yeah, it got sent to us. We looked at it and he, he made a post of two overweight people in uh, silver body paint at Burning Man. And he said, people on psychedelics doing the work, quote, end quote, doing the work. Right. And in the comment section was hilarious. There's a lot of people that are like, yeah, man, I'm so sick of this plant medicine talk and blah, blah, blah. And people say that they're, you know, psychedelics to change my life, X, Y, and Z. That's a lot of chatter from the peanut gallery, from people who have not participated. And such is the nature of social media. So we'll give it that. Um, to bend my understanding of where I think he's coming from, is there truth in what he's saying? And, and I just got off, you know, talking with Fit for Service about this letting go of the need to be right. If I'm in a conversation with somebody or an argument with somebody, can I adopt the idea that there's some truth in what they're saying? Maybe not the whole truth, but some truth. I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I absolutely can adopt the idea that a lot of people are speaking about this stuff like it's a cure-all. And a lot of people are speaking about it as a panacea. And a lot of people who are not integrating are continually going back. I've seen run across dozens of people in ayahuasca ceremonies that looked like they were in the same boat year after year, um, had the same intentions year after year, you know? And it was clear to me, like, something's not happening in between. Something's missing in between. Part of that comes back to what container is being set, who is guiding me through that experience. That's why mentors are important. We need mentors through humans in 3D that are living, not just old philosophers. And then we also need old philosophers. We need to grab the great materials from the, the great thinkers that came before us and learn from that and bring that into our own alchemy. And that doesn't take plant medicine. Um, you, you could do that through any form of altered state, through the darkness retreat, through uh, holotropic breath work, through vision questing with no food, no water for four days or longer. All of these things have the ability to transform us because they break us open and they connect us to a, they can connect us to a deeper part of ourselves. So many paths lead up the mountain. But again, you know, shitting on, on psychedelics, it would be like shitting on the vision quest. It'd be like shitting on the darkness. What you do with that is up to you. And in large part, it's who's guiding you through that experience is going to dictate what you're capable of doing with that, right? Because these things can be fracturing. If I didn't have the experience that I had leading up to 30 grams of penis envy, I'd have been fucking lost. And the reason I still was lost from the 5-MEO is because it didn't stop. I left the ceremony. I was fine and sober. And when I went to bed, it switched right back on. Reactivation from high-dose 5-MEO is a real issue to consider when you're deciding if that's a plant medicine or, or animal medicine you want to work with. I personally don't have any calling whatsoever to have a high dose of that ever again in my life. Because when you go home and you go by yourself and you're going to bed, there's no shaman there. There's no guide. There's no mentor. You're fucking alone on the medicine. And if that's kicking back on, like that can lead to real issues. And it most certainly did for me. So there are pitfalls. There are, there are, um, points at which we would look at something and say, uh, we should reel that in a little bit, at least let people know about that experience. And I have done that uh, in those podcasts. So we'll link to those in the show notes if you're unfamiliar with that, if you're new to the show, that kind of thing. Um, another point that many people decided to make uh, available in Ryan's comment section was that Marcus Aurelius and a lot of the Stoic philosophers were in large part curated from initiatory experiences using plant medicines and altered states of consciousness. The great thinkers, the Greek philosophers, they were a part of the Eleusinian mysteries. They were a part of all these old initiatory practices that, that Brian Marusco dives deeply into in the Immortality Key. And John Lamb Lash dives deeply into in the book, Not in His Image. We'll link to all those books. Any book I mention is going to be linked to in the show notes. Darkness and fasting, they were all a part of it. Any way to crack us open. And oftentimes they were combined. People could go in to uh, a chamber that was pitch black and they would be guided oftentimes by high priestesses, women who, who would be the guides and the acting shaman in those, in those situations. And they would keep them there for 72 hours on medicine, re-upping the dose as they awoke to keep them in an altered state for three days, only to come out on the other side of that reborn, having died before you die so you could truly live. 
Now that's not up for everybody. This is a full on initiation. This is not, um, you know, some mushrooms at the beach or acid at Burning Man or a hippie flip or any of these other experiences. And those can all be acid can be a ceremony. Hippie flips can be a ceremony. They most certainly can. I had the fortune, my wife and I had the fortune of guiding my father through a hippie flip. And that was one of the most healing experiences of my life for me personally, but especially for him in his own words, maybe at some point I'll get him to talk about it on the podcast. Um, that was incredible, right? So you can it's set and setting. It's the container. What container is set? And that is a part of the conversation that's eliminated when you simply say people on psychedelics doing the work and you show someone at Burning Man. Even Burning Man, for that matter, can is a challenge, no doubt, but also can be transformative. I've had two experiences at Burning Man and obviously, um, maybe not so obviously, some people just go there and drink booze, but I was certainly taking different medicines in party form. I was there using acid not to have a deep inner journey, but to have a great time. And I did have a great time. And there were moments of those, that experience over the course of three days in my first trip and five days in my second, where it became really transformative, where I could see things differently. And I could certainly realign myself to my center through fucking all the extremes of being off center. All right. Finally, we're going to talk about uh, a friend of mine who's a leader in the fitness industry and has been an advocate for plant medicines who turned the table with a, with a blog uh, after a book that he read and really spoke to the dangers and the dangers through a very Christian ideology. You know, like this is the work of the devil, et cetera, et cetera. And um, based on this book that he had read, and I don't need to dive super far into the details, but if you want alchemy from that, if you're wondering, like, is that correct? Paul Check and Hamilton Souther, who I've both had on this podcast, uh, Hamilton recently, and Paul check has been on more than anyone else, did an excellent episode on the do's and don'ts of plant medicines. It's four hours and change, and it's worth every minute of your time. At the two hour and 10 minute mark, uh, they really dive into this. And without naming names, they just dive right in. Um, what he was talking about in the blog versus what is actually happening via the altered state. And one of the things that Hamilton brings up is if you have whatever packaging you're given, programming you're given as a child, you will come to terms with that at some point. And it's up to you what you do with it. So if the good and evil, uh, God and the devil thing comes up for you because you're programmed with that, with that like many of us were, if that comes up for you in the ceremony via any plant medicine, that's an opportunity for alchemy. That's an opportunity to see beyond that. Anything in polarity is in the world of 10,000 things. Anything in polarity is an operation of mind. And Paul Check really dives deeply into this. You're going to get chapter after chapter on this in his new uh, uh, series of books that he's going to have out hopefully by the end of the year. So I'm not going to dive too far into that, but understand that is mind stuff. When I talked to Hamilton Souther, I was able to sit with him uh, with some different medicines. And I talked about that on our podcast together. I'll also link to that in the show notes. I asked him, I was telling Hamilton about my hell experiences and he said, exactly, I've been there. And I said, well, please describe it. And he said, hell is only mine. There's no love in hell because it's all mind. There's no heart in hell. It's all mind. And that blew me the fuck away. I said, actually, yeah, I had no words for that. And what you described is exactly the feeling. And so he said, we're going to go back to the center of consciousness and we'll reconnect your head to your heart. And he said it with such authority that I knew he wasn't beating around the bush. And I knew he knew exactly what he was talking about. And that's exactly what we did on a very low dose of a couple of different things, uh, ketamine and cannabis, straight to the center, reconnected that. And I realized I have a lot of built up PTSD in my body. It was very hard for me to take a breath. And as I was shuddering through that, releasing it, I realized, oh shit, all right, uh, this is something I'm going to need to continue to work on. And because he was singing Icaros, I felt the calling for ayahuasca. This is the lead in to me wanting to go back to that medicine in particular to continue to do that work. Now, many people would point out, especially the naysayers would point out. So you had these transformative experiences and then you bit off more than you could chew and you kind of, kind of got fucked up. And now you're going back to medicine to heal the thing that you got fucked up from precisely. <laughs> and so when people speak to the perils of these things, uh, there is an element of truth in there and an element of caution. And at the same time, there's an element of don't write the thing off because you had a bad experience. Don't write the thing off because your Christian ideology said that it was the devil or it was bad. At the 250 mark, two hours and 50 minutes, Paul Check dies into his understanding of consciousness. God says yes to all experience. God says yes to all experience. This is the only way to know itself and the only way to know and live all possibility. 
I'm paraphrasing him. This is my own intuition on some of this stuff. This is how unconditional love is made manifest. Now, Paul has been studying this for, for decades. He's, he's uh, older, wiser, and has far more experience in this field than I do. And at the same time, you can come to a place on medicines where this is what you'll understand. This is the gnosis, right? And that's a hard gnosis to face because it means saying yes to darkness. It means saying yes to the ugly shit we see in the world. And it's very challenging when we think of the high and mighty father with a white beard who's loving and all the things, uh, or Jesus or whoever the fuck, whoever, whoever we picture when we think of the highest form of consciousness, that the highest form of consciousness also says yes to everything, everything. Robert Anton Wilson, um, who I'm going to bring up here, he wrote uh, several books. He's a brilliant guy, Prometheus Rising, um, Cosmic Trigger is the one I'm referring to, but he speaks to reality tunnels. And I'll, I'll bring this back up here towards the end, but reality tunnels. I mentioned on the podcast before when I was uh, right, right after Peter Crone, or maybe it was during the Peter Crone podcast, um, he doesn't believe in reality. There is no singular reality. He believes in reality tunnels. And the tunnel that you're in is the divine mirror. It's the tunnel that's going to say yes to what you believe. It's going to be the tunnel that says yes to your understanding of consciousness. That doesn't mean that we don't have first principles or common laws that build this thing that we operate through. That doesn't mean physics doesn't exist. It doesn't mean, um, you know, <laughs> it, all that stuff still holds. But within that, within those parameters of the container of reality itself, we do have reality tunnels. And I know that through firsthand experience. When I thought I was in hell, I fucking lived in hell. And I lived in hell in 3D waking reality just as much as I did at night when the 5MEO kicked back on. Not a fun experience. Uh, the Buddha speaks to the six levels that you can live in and operating from the middle being the best. Um, don't need to dive into that, but if you want to, you can look up the Buddha, Buddhist levels and, and ask about hell there. And trust me when I say this, like hell is a reality. And, and what's inherently true about that is that you do feel a separation. You don't feel a sense of the divine. I most certainly did not feel a sense of the divine. But the divine mirror will, will show us where we're at. And so if we have the level of awareness to perceive, this is what I'm seeing. If I like it, cool. If I don't like it, it's up to me to change that. That's what takes us out of victim consciousness and puts us back in the driver's seat. We have to look at that and question if this is the reality I want to live in or not. And that has been a very challenging thing for me over the last three years in particular is looking out in the world and saying, what the fuck is happening right now? This is not the world in which I want to live. This is not the reality that I want to partake in. This is not the society that I want to partake in. And, and really coming to terms with that. And so it's still, that's a part of the alchemy that's still ongoing. And, I, and by no means do I think that we're done with uh, the fuckery or the shenanigans that we're seeing in the world at large. I think there's more of that to come and more alchemy to take place from that. And perhaps more importantly, more of the great awakening, more of the great remembering that will take place from that. So my intention uh, going into this one uh, amongst the, the bigger intentions around this with many little intentions, but the bigger intentions were to open my heart and basically to spend more time living there than in my mind. Um, there is a term for this in Shipibo, since we were sitting with Shipibo, that uh, the intake person at Soltara let me know about, and I've, I've forgotten that, unfortunately, <laughs> whatever that, that word was. I found it really cool that they actually had a term for it, because she mentioned that it is a part of the trajectory of all people on the plant medicine course, um, in particular with ayahuasca, that we, we run into that. We, we cross that threshold and, and live from the heart rather than the mind. Uh, that does not mean that I stop paying attention to what's happening in the world. It does not mean that I surrender my guns and ammunition to a government that I think uh, does not have the, our best interests in mind. It does not mean any of that, but it does mean that I spend more time in my heart rather than trying to sort everything out through the mind, which operates on polarity. Another big one was to heal the central nervous system and the PTSD that I had had through the dark night of the soul. And that was made quite apparent to me uh, in my experience with Hamilton was still there. You know, it's very hard for me to take a deep breath. And I know that that is running, that system's running. Uh, read The Body Keeps Score. Read It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin. All of these things are there. And that was a big part of the alchemy for me was in healing and releasing that. And to be perfectly honest, that's what made every night I sat there one of the most challenging experiences in my life. Physically, 
it was incredibly challenging. Uh, and then, you know, certain nights as I dive into were a little bit more mentally, emotionally, and spiritually challenging. Uh, do you have to go into the experience? This is worth, men- worth mentioning. Um, I had taken Kratom on and off for about a year and could jump off whenever the fuck I wanted because it was mostly between noon and 8 p.m. So it was an afternoon thing. I'd get my work done and I'd also wake up each day and sauna an ice bath. When my ice bath broke, I stopped going in the sauna and slowly but surely started having morning doses of Kratom. And that 16-8 fasting window of 16 hours off, eight hours on flipped to 16 hours on, eight hours off, minus the sauna and ice bath. And after about a year of doing that, when I went to come off for this journey, uh, I experienced all, every fucking side effect known, known to man. And I had a thought before that maybe it's, it's not that big of a deal because I'm not taking an extract. I'm just taking a powder. Um, it was incredibly challenging. I've never been, thank God, never been hooked on opiates or anything like that from um, pharmaceuticals or heroin or things of that nature. Uh, but this was telltale signs of opiate withdrawal. I had experienced hot and cold when I would go to sleep at night. My legs, I had restless leg syndrome for the first time in my life. My legs would fucking jolt like a blast of electricity and I'd flex my quad as hard as I could for three to five seconds and then, oh, fuck, I got to rip the covers off me. Holy shit, I'm freezing. I got to pull them back on. It's not a fun experience. I ever want to repeat again. And um, it was very challenging. And that was a part of me really giving myself to this medicine was saying, I'm going to come completely off and, and give the time window necessary to be off of this beforehand. This, this is a part of dieta that not everyone will experience if you don't have a creative addiction like I did. Um, and at the same time, it is a very real thing because I've promoted this and had kratom sponsors. And I think it is a very useful and amazing plant medicine tool when used with respect and reverence. Um, so a big part of my journey prior to and during was in that respect and reverence piece around said, said medicine. Uh, temperance card is what I pulled from the tarot deck and for all of 2023. And then it showed up to me. Uh, my wife bought me a, a, a little tarot deck card holder, which was lovely. And when you do that, they sent out, I don't know which one it is. So I can't, I am sorry. I can't relay this in the show notes. If you're interested in the same thing, <laughs> sorry, uh, don't have that info, but they send out one holographic major arcana card. And as you would guess, that was also the temperance card. So I have that on my water bottle. And for all of these, you know, all of these cards or archetypes or things that you discuss, they have many, many, many meanings. So when I discuss one aspect of it, don't, (laughs) well, I heard it was X, Y, and Z. Sure. Um, The main piece of the temperance card that I've been working with is balance through extremes. Did not understand that when I pulled it, totally understand it now, balance through extremes. So uh, I was not in right relation with Kratom. And, and I had to pay the price for that. I didn't, I'm not going to relive that experience. I've worked with Dr. Dan Engel and some other people on designing um, what Jamie Wheel spoke about in Stealing Fire as a hedonic calendar. I always thought that was bullshit because it would leave off the table um, spontaneity and feeling. And when am I called to do the thing? But the truth is, I feel great when I'm on Kratom. I feel like I parent very well. I feel I can get into my body better. And I don't feel fucked up mentally like I would on cannabis. So it's an excellent way for me to celebrate. It's an excellent way for me to train and do yoga or any of these things and be in my body. And so finding the right relationship with that is a part of ongoing alchemy. Uh, And that's what led up to the journey. So the diet to there was largely based around that. And um, ketones really helped me with the lack of sleep. Um, I talked with both founders of HVM and ketones on this podcast, and both of them mentioned to me about people utilizing ketones with ayahuasca. And many people would say they didn't name names because, oh, they're, you know, this, how could you combine something, a supplement with that? You're not supposed to do it that way. And the truth is, there are many cultures that fast when they drink ayahuasca. And as you're fasted, your body will create ketones. So my understanding of that was a full yes. I am adding energy in the form of ketones to my body. This is what happens when I fast. And I'm going to take that with the medicine. And I did. And it was absolutely, and it was an experience like I had never experienced before. So thanks to those guys, HVMN, um, for mentioning that. And I don't think there's any coincidence in them both mentioning that on the podcast. Uh, You can decide what you want to ask and decide for yourself, you know, if that's something you want to participate with. But I think there is uh, a lot of potential 
there in, with regards to having healing experiences through these things that keep us up all night and having something that can balance neurochemistry, give us energy, the energy necessary to get through a long night and do well the next day. Ketones are great for that with a lack of sleep. So they were great before, during, and after my process there at Zoltara. All right. Share the gospel with everyone. And when necessary, use words. Only when necessary, use words. All right. Uh, I'm going to give some night-by-night -night cliff notes. Um, first and foremost, you know, the entirety of the journey is the journey, right? The, the when does this start and when does it stop? It's not the first night you drink and the last night you drink. It certainly has not been that way for me. And my experience oftentimes is written about by Jeremy Narby and DNA and the Cosmic Serpent. As soon as you sign up, the medicine starts working with you. And it's unique in that way. If I plan a mushroom journey, I don't start getting weird dreams <laughs> and downloads ahead of time, but I do uniquely with ayahuasca. And um, that's pretty fascinating to me, how that works. Uh, the intelligence of that medicine. And, um, you know, I've mentioned the, the, the hummingbird medicine for me has been just really potent throughout my life. Um, my first medicine man, Huitzi, which is short for Huitzi Lapoche, um, was an Aztec and mestizo man who first got me into plant medicines. He was the first guy to bring me out to Native American reservations for sweat lodges. And for you, those of you who think that's fucking cultural appropriation, uh, the caretaker of the land who was Native American told me if they don't share these medicines now, they will be lost. So that's why I was allowed to go there. And that's why she continues to have people of all color and all background at her, at her, on her land to perform in these medicine circles. So thank you to her for having that updated awareness around these things and allowing me to really shift my life going forward. Um, Huitzi, you know, that he is the hummingbird God, right? And, and, uh, the God of war, you know, uh, as some people would put, and a lot of people will go and read up on Huitzi Lapoche and say, oh, they did fucking human sacrifice for that God and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, that was not my interaction with, with my coach in real life, nor was it my interaction with, with Huitzi Lapoche in the medicine. The day bear was born. I won't rehash this whole thing, but the day bear was born. He came a few days early, our first child. And while I was watering plants in the backyard, a hummingbird came up to me at eye level, three feet away from me, flapping its wings, just staring at me. And I was like, holy shit, uh, this has never happened to me in my life before. And because I've had some medicine journeys, I recognized there's something here. And um, it flew off and I just, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I go to the front yard, start watering the trees I'd planted up there. And sure enough, it comes back with a second one right up my face. And right as I speak out loud, I do not understand you. I recognize right then what they're saying. And Dr. Will Tegel, who was one of my mentors who recently passed away, he wrote a whole book on this called The Mother Tongue. He also speaks to it in his book, Walking with Bears, that there's an unwritten language that all of nature speaks. And when we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we can tap into that. And right as I said, I don't understand you, I understand what they were saying. They were congratulating me on the birth of bear and that today was the day. And so tears running down my face. I run to the garage like a crazy person. I tell Tosh, I say, he's coming today. The hummingbirds just told me and I'm fucking blown away. And sure enough, he comes that night, three days early at 11.02 PM. So I have had these interactions on medicine. I've had these interactions on, uh, uh, in the 3d and, um, hummingbird medicine was a massive part of our experience. Um, one of my close friends who had just been to the Amazon right before me gave me a medicine blanket made by the Shipibo, which had the hummingbird on it. And, you know, I've got a lot of different animals on my arm uh, with this tattoo, but the hummingbird was the one she intuitively selected, Heidi. And uh, sure enough, that was a big part of the journey. So our very first day when we get there, we do a vomitivo, which is an old practice of cleansing. You drink lemongrass tea in this experience uh, until you purge. And the idea of this is that it's going to clean you out. And at the same time, it also helps us by allowing us to puke in front of one another during broad daylight. We're cheering each other on. It's a lot like college hazing uh, with no alcohol. And that gets people to feel less self less self-conscious when they're going to purge at night in darkness, or for me in particular, purging while the silence is still going on. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so it's very good. It's a very good uh, thing to do. And we go and we sit in there and we talk about our in intentions in the maloka. And sure enough, a hummingbird flies in, flies into the maloka, this giant, beautiful, circular maloka. 
The problem is the doors open and there's screens at the top. So this thing can't get out and it's just flying around, just flying everywhere. And, and uh, Matias Stefano from Gaia TV was one of the guys that was with us. And he talks about how the hummingbird is a great omen because the hummingbird is the highest vibrational animal in the world. It's vibrating high, not just because of its heartbeat and its wing beat, but because it is that. It is, it is a being of the light. And this is a great omen. And I feel it. I recognize it through and through. Eventually, it gets tired and just collapses and falls down to one of our mats, thankfully. And it's nursed back to health with a little bit of honey, and it flies off and it lives. That's day one, before any medicine. Uh, as we dive in, and then forgive me if this is all over the place, but I'm gonna, I have this outline here so I can hopefully track some thread going through it. Um, one of the things that I love to do, as, as taught by Paul Check, is to draw tarot cards um, prior to the journey to see kind of where I'm going in, with regards to my intention. And both of those uh, do play out in some regard to one another. So what I had drawn for the three nights was the six of wands. And I'm just going to break these down very simply here. So again, if you want to look into these, uh, be my guest. The zero, the fool card, and the 13 card death. And the six of wands is for fiery creative people. And it's a lot about the love of family, the love of job, the love of career, the love of nature, the love of everything you have in your life. And I was like, fuck yeah, I got that in spades. Let's go. That's night one. The zero card is the fool. That is the God card. It is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending. It is everything in between that. It's where the tarot starts and where the tarot ends. And um, as Paul brilliantly stated, he's like, you might meet God on the second night. You might meet God when the fool comes up. And uh, that was just an incredible experience that I'll, I'll unpack in a second. 13, the death card. That was my final night. <laughs> and... Uh, and the the mirrors uh, of which that that portrayed itself in in actual 3D and on the medicine were uh, right in line with that death and rebirth right and this is a big piece on regenerative agriculture and regeneration and learning about how we interact with the land is that life is built on death so I didn't look at that like oh fuck I'm gonna die but life is built on death and. Um, that was an important piece to take with me into that journey. How I has worked with me personally is that, you know, when I pull these cards, the first night is the first card, the second night is the second card, the third night is the third card. That's how it's been for me since I started this practice. And um, even if I just have three things I'm working on, it's typically the first thing's the first night, the second's the second night, third's the third night. So again, it worked this way. And then Paul also did alchemy. Uh, through numerology and showed me that the six and the 13 equals the 19. This is the sun card, which we'll unpack. And then finally, if you break that down further, that's the magician. Sun representing the return of the Christ, the second coming, the, the return of childhood innocence, joy, um, trust, and awe and curiosity. And that was uh, exactly where I left off. The magician I'm still working on, that is mastery of self, and mastery of the external world. So again, alchemy is ongoing, um, but these did flow. Night one, um, and first and foremost, I'll say, you know, sitting with them four years ago, I thought the medicine was good, but I didn't think it was that strong. And in hindsight, I realized the reason why I wasn't that strong was because I was there with my wife and her boyfriend and a lot of people that I didn't know. And it took me as far as I could go. It took me to the point at which uh, I could handle in between then, I'd had some really deep journeys with other medicines, and now sitting in a circle of men, most of which have experience, and um, felt very comfortable going all the way in. So less medicine, nights one, two, and three, took me further than I've ever gone before on ayahuasca, which is really cool because, you know, I by no means think I've got it all figured out, but 28, 29, and 30 of the journey is sitting with it, and I'm still blown the fuck away like absolutely blown away by the potentials of it and really blown away by how deep that medicine can go where dose doesn't seem to be the cause of it. And I'm not sure if that translates well enough. Um, you take 10 grams of mushrooms, it's a lot different than 15. It's a lot different than 20. It's a, lot, it's a hell of a lot different than 30. Um, and yet ayahuasca, you know, there's been nights where I've had four cups and you know, my last night I had a one and a half cups and that one and a half was stronger than any journey I've ever had before. Now, that was due to a, a hundreds of factors, one of which being I was ready for that, and this was my death experience, and others being that um, what was shown to me is that I've kind of paved the way for that with some of the larger journeys. Uh, the vision I got was like an eight-lane highway with no cars on it. 
Like I could just fucking go with the lightest dose uh, as fast as I wanted to go and as deep as I wanted to go. So that that's pretty cool in a sense, I guess. Night one, um, this was, you know, a lot of parallels with Aubrey's talk around the his Rose Dieta. I think he used like the analogy of Gandalf with the staff and the flames of Sauron coming at him and the staff is just splitting the flames so he's not getting burnt. Um, you know, it's like holding that, that, that love is the intention to burn through all the chaos around him. For me, it felt like I was walking on a tightrope where there was chaos on either side of me. But when I found my center and my balance point in the heart through love, um, I found peace and equanimity. And I'm mostly speaking to the mind here because uh, the body did feel, you know, it was, it was challenging in every single aspect. I had to yawn constantly. That's a form of purging. I had a lot of stress in my jaw over the last four years that I was releasing and working on. Um, didn't puke the first night, but after taking a shit, which is a purge, it felt like it cut the medicine in half and I could really work with it at that point, having uh, taken a fairly fast blast off and, and really start to work from there on and see all the things that I want to contribute to the land with and uh, what my relationship to nature actually is. And from there, there was a lot of harmony and beauty with all the things that I love, exactly what the Six of Wands was to me as I was going into that space. Um, but yes, plenty of challenge with the, c- the central nervous system reset. Night two, the God card. Jokingly, I wrote an intention, uh, half jokingly, that I said I wanted to ride the Rainbow Light Bridge to Valhalla. And my brother Naveen, who had come, who is American, but his parents are from India, is, uh, believe it or not, way into Norse mythology and uh, frequently taps into the wisdom of Odin. And I love Norse mythology. Uh, I've been diving into Neil Gaiman's work. American Gods is a great book. And, and one of the things that they propose in American Gods is that if there's enough weight of it in human consciousness, it exists in the fold. It exists in consciousness. So people always argue um, which God is right, which God is which. There is one totality. There is one all consciousness. And below that all consciousness, Anything that's been thought of or dreamed of that carries enough weight and energy exists. They talk about this in the book Egregores. Don't need to li- you can link to that if you want, Jose, but it's going to get long. Um, meaning, if cultures for thousands of years believed in Odin and Thor, they fucking exist in the zeitgeist. If cultures believed in the Hindu pantheon for thousands of years and still to this day, they're alive and well. They're rocking and rolling somewhere in the ether. Somewhere they exist in reality. And the imprint on our consciousness absolutely exists. Um, Again, Hamilton and Paul break that down at 210 and 250 in their podcast uh, together, which I'll link to in the show notes. It's a great podcast. Understanding that, I knew that it is possible to ride the Rainbow Light Bridge to Valhalla and see what Odin or what the divine light has to say to me. What does Asgard look like? Let's, let's Let's have a peek at that. Coincidentally, which I don't fucking believe in, synchronistically, uh, Naveen comes up to me before the second ceremony and he says, hey, I was supposed to give you this the first night, but I gave one to Matthias. It's the rune for the key to Valhalla. And it was made specifically, I had it made for you at the Taj Mahal. I look at this guy. (laughs) I'm like, first off, this is the night. Uh, Secondly, I'll tell you why later. I don't want to jinx it. So he hands me this key to the Valhalla, one of the runes. And... um, I start blowing smoke over it and just lay it right on my heart. And I'm waiting for this, uh, you know, waiting to have our medicine and kick the night off. And, um, you know, they rotate with who starts first. So I get to go and I actually start the night with two cups, um, which, you know, it's potent medicine. It works quickly. And this felt faster than any experience that I've ever had before with Aya. Like it was like a rocket ship ride straight through. I mean, there was no riding of a light bridge. It was like an immersion in light. And it's as strong as any experience I've ever had prior, like as strong as DMT, but not at the pace of DMT, just like the, the, the lengthiness of ayahuasca. Um, again, I see the vision of the, I ask why this is happening the way that it is. And I see the eight lane superhighway in the brain. And um, in that experience and space of being fully immersed in, you know, uh, light and fractal energy and, and, um, frequency. That's the word I'm looking for. I know that I've been in this space before and I just recognize like what's here for me to see. And what I see is this beautiful purple hummingbird next to a ton of these, these 
building blocks that have numbers and alphabets on them, uh, letters on them. And I'm like, fuck, man, am I going to have a vision of my third, of our third kid? And, and I really don't feel prepared for that. And, I, and I've even requested that I <laughs> get an invitation from all people involved, my wife and both kids, if that's going to be the case, because it's been such a challenge having two kids. And I don't really get much on that. Um, what I get is that it is, there is a childlikeness uh, to the space that I'm seeing. It's why I'm seeing the building blocks. It's why I'm seeing the hummingbird itself. And I can't really associate the hummingbird with the child, the, the childlikeness, and I can't associate it with the wonder, but it's imprinting something on me. And, you know, as, as it can happen, maybe you don't know, it's just filler words, uh, as it can happen in journeys like this, more gets illuminated later. So sure enough, I see it, I witness it, I feel it, I feel the presence, it feels, the presence, I feel the presence of it feels childlike and it feels awe-inspiring and I'm curious about it and I don't need to know why in the moment. And as I ask, I'm not given the answer, but I, I table that and I recognize, okay, there's something there. There's something there that I'm going to unpack later. Uh, more shit happens and it's, uh, you know, challenging in its own way. And that's the end of that night three. Um, we go into this and it's the, it's the death ceremony. And, and I had on paper that I was going to have two cups again, because it seemed like the right dose. And as we're getting ready to start, it sounds like every dog before we've had any medicine, it sounds like every fucking dog in Costa Rica is fighting in real life, in the 3D. And I'm like, fuck, man, what's happening right now? And I can hear this woman <laughs> way off in the distance yelling in Spanish uh, what appears that to be that she needs help. Later, it was explained sometimes, you know, neighboring dogs will eat a chicken and then the dogs that protect the chicken will fight with the other dogs for eating a chicken. And that, that's, just, that's just sometimes how it goes. But because this was the death ceremony and I'm hearing pure chaos outside, uh, I start to check in and I'm like, I think I need less. So I'm going to start with one and a half instead of two. And again, absolutely fucking arbitrary. Uh, I don't think, I think half a cup would have sent me the exact same fucking place because that's where I was going. So night three starts out that way. And um, rocket ship ride, you know, as fast as, even faster than the night before, there's a 45 minute to an hour long period of silence before they start singing Icaros. And both the second and third night, I was the first one to pop. I was the first one to purge in dead silence, ringing out, ringing it out. And, um, and you know, I have not been able to purge in several journeys, maybe the last 15 to 20. And I'm often jealous if my wife will purge because I know what a deep emotional release that can be. And I'm sitting here looking and like, oh, I'm going to shit later, but. I really wish I had some of that for me, you know, and I just didn't get it. And like, this is like, all right, I got stuff to purge. And it took me to the place that I had previously demarcated and described as hell. But this was the first time where I was able to recognize it as the Tao. And I'm going to explain these things. When I talked to Paul Check originally after my dark night of the soul, and I said, the space that I keep entering is one in which every thought that I have, the equal and opposite is shown to be true. And he said, of course. That's why the Tao cannot be spoken. And I was like, uh, I need more of that. And he started to unpack it. So I'm going to read to you from a book, two passages, the first two from Lao Tzu's The Tao Te Ching. And uh, this, this interpretation is from Ursula K. Le Guin. So you can have the, you, can, you know, sh show notes will have all this good stuff. Dowing. So no, first, first, uh, first one here. The way you can go isn't the real way. The name you can say isn't the real name. Heaven and earth begin in the unnamed. Names the mother of the 10,000 things. So the unwanting soul sees what's hidden, and the ever-wanting soul sees only what it wants. Two things, one origin, but different in name. Whose identity is mystery. Mystery of all mysteries. The door to the hidden. And then at the, you know, she has some beautiful commentary. She basically states at the end there, if you see this rightly, it contains everything, the entire context of the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> Second one, soul food. Everybody on earth knowing that beauty is beautiful makes ugliness. Everybody knowing that goodness is good makes wickedness. 
For being and non-being arise together. Hard and easy complete each other. Long and short shape each other. High and low depend on each other. Note and voice make the music together. Before and after follow each other. That's why the wise soul does without doing, teaches without talking. The things of this world exist. They are. You can't refuse them. To bear and not to own, to act and not lay claim, to do the work and let it go, for just letting it go is what makes it stay. Now, there's a lot of paradox in those things, and I'll, I'll mention this again, the Kabbalion on Hermetic philosophy via the three initiates, also linked in the show notes. Uh, takes a deep dive at this from a non-poetic angle um, through the law of polarity. But the poetry actually is a little bit more medicinal. It's why many of the great teachers taught in parable, right? There's a, there's a piece that we can hack, and, and Dana Griffith does this beautifully as well. There's a piece we can hack that comes through the song or the poem that is, it's just not there when we try to understand it with the rational mind only. So again, I want to speak to the rational mind. I want to speak to the the inner knowing. I want to speak to the heart. I want to speak to all these things because that's the best way for me to learn. And I think these, these do help one another. But this was the space that I was in. And whereas in the first night I was able to have, hold love of my family, love of my life, love of nature as a center point and walk the tightrope, this felt like I was flung into the fucking middle of nowhere <laughs> up shit Creek without a paddle, uh, out in the middle of the ocean with no paddle. And, um, my mind wouldn't stop. It absolutely wouldn't stop. And I'd be taken down rabbit holes and it'd bring me right back to the beginning. And it would show me the equal and opposite was true. And I would fucking be able to play in that space as far as I could, knowing it was absolutely meaningless and knowing that I had no way of fucking controlling and stopping it. And I'd say, am I listening? That was a mantra I had. Am I listening? Would bring me back to center normally, but for this, it was a blip. To compare that to my first journey, my first journey, I felt all this anger, resentment, and judgment come up and it welled up inside me until I puked. And when I puked, it was gone and I had three hours of fucking pure bliss. And then again, I felt anger, judgment, resentment come up and I felt it all come up and then, ah, and then I felt pure bliss. This, I felt a fucking split second of bliss and then back to having to contort my body and breathe into challenging spaces. I'd fucking reset my body and I would only feel moments, very small moments of equanimity before rabbit holing more and more thought. And it really felt relentless. I mean, if I'm going to, that was the word that kept coming to me. And interestingly enough, uh, Eric Godsey, who was with me, he, he's doing a, um, his own trip report because homeboy had seven nights. He had back to back weeks. And, um, He's going to talk about about the 30 grams experience that I had on that podcast. I'm going to talk. He's one of the only people I've met that has had very similar hell experiences that I have, really challenging experiences, uh, where some of the same language comes up for us. And um, he entered the same space that I did on night three. And so we got to talk about that afterwards. Um, but it felt to me, and I'll break this down, it felt to me at the time that I was just being tortured for the sake of torture. Like this was the part of the death experience. And I prayed that this would not be the actual way, like what happens when my body dies. I recognized that my body wasn't dying, but I was like, if it's fucking this hard when I actually die, I fucking hope not. I pray not. And um, I remember saying, make it stop, please, please, you know, make it stop, make it stop, please make it stop. And I recognized right as I'm saying that in my mind, there is no stopping. I have enough experience to know that. What's a better way to pray or for it? And I'll, I'll please allow this to move along. And in the space of the eternal, what had happened before on um, by the Mio and other things is that when you reach eternity, and Jamie Wheel breaks this down very beautifully, but when you reach eternity, it's all there is and all there ever was. So there can be a sense of like, everything is make-believe. Everything is illusory. This is all that exists. This is all that ever did exist. There is no beginning and no ending. Every creation story is fucking laughable because they're just story. And any story in the Tao creates distortion. The equal and opposite is always true. And so I open my eyes and I, I see, uh, you know, one of the, the Quindero's singing to my left and then to me and to my right. And in those three songs, I had hoped I would feel time moving. I did not feel time moving. 
So as I made the prayer, please allow this to move. I just didn't feel it. And that was scary as fuck because it brought me back to the, some of those really challenging spaces. And I knew that was a part of my alchemy was to re-enter those spaces. But still being there also was the place of, <laughs> of me getting mind fucked. And I did just wanted a doorway out. And so I made the, I made, um, the claim at that point, I will have alchemy from this experience tonight. Tonight, I will have alchemy from this experience tonight. And I couldn't even light my, my mapacho. I was so in it. And I just held that prayer in the mapacho. I will have alchemy from this tonight. And time did pass. And I had trust because the container at Sultara is as good as I've ever been a part of. They have Dennis McKenna and Gabor Mate on their board. They have learned from the very best about how these the experiences should go. And they have brought in the very best from the Shipibo tribe that rotate once every four months. You get a new, new group in once every four months. The people we sat with were the same people I'd sat in 2019. Amerigo has been, Amerigo has been guiding in this medicine for 29 years. His wife, Olga, has been doing it for 15 years. They're not rookies. These are black belts, absolute black belts uh, holding this space. And I had trust in them and I had trust in the medicine and I had trust in the space that I was in. And, you know, as it ended, and I'll backtrack a little bit, but as it ended, that trust is what allowed me to feel more complete exiting that experience than I had in any previous experience where I had got that far into consciousness and the understanding of it. Uh, God, whatever you want to call that, that thing, the source of all. Any previous experience I was that I'd been to, I in, in many ways was not prepared to go that deep, but now felt prepared to go that deep and felt held through the experience, which was in a large part a lot different than doing 30 grams of mushrooms solo or doing 5-MEO with a guide and then going home and having to deal with more of that solo. So um, I did feel held. I did feel guided through it. And I had that firm understanding and uh, as it ended, you know, the night ended, I finally smoked my cigar and I felt a deep sense of peace and calm. I felt like there was alchemy around those experiences, especially as I knew to label correctly the place that I'd been as the Tao and not hell. And that was, a, uh, you know, for me, a lot of my alchemy was in, in getting back to those places that I had been before with a different understanding of them. And... That takes that took for me. It took going back to those places, and that's exactly what I did with me. Um, and it's just different for everybody, you know. Godzi Godzi went there too for some alchemy. Nobody else in the room did. So, and it doesn't mean they didn't have their own challenges. It just means that uh, uniquely we we got to grapple with those spaces. So I couldn't fall asleep, um, chilling in the room, and Godzi comes back in. It's five a.m. And we start chopping it up. And he tells me about his experience and that he basically went to the same space I did. And he tells me something very important. He tells me something that I uh, didn't have words for at the time, but made perfect sense. He said, it felt like ayahuasca had been teaching him surrender in almost every journey prior. And I can attest to that. Uh, ayahuasca does a beautiful job of teaching, has done a beautiful job of teaching me surrender and how to surrender. But that this time it wasn't surrender. It was more like, to endure. And I was like, fuck, man, that is, that's exactly it. Be because I had the ability in the first two nights to control more or less where my focal point was. I could control being in my center versus letting my mind run rampant. And I could not in the last night. I just had to deal with the relentless mind, thinking, 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 rabbit holing ideas that none of which made sense, all of which had to equal and opposite is true. And that's an ultimate mind fuck. And I just had to deal with it and endure it. And in doing so, as Paul Check mentions on his podcast, there is a certain amount of benefit from that because I appreciate the 3D way more than I ever have in my life before. Um, Ram Dass talks about this in Becoming Nobody, phenomenal audible, audible uh, of him doing lectures across the country. And, um, he talks about his buddy, Alan Watts, saying, your problem is you're addicted to being high, either through meditation or through med plant medicine or psychedelics. You've forgotten your humanity. And um, so we chat. There's alchemy there. And um, I can't sleep. So I decide to get up, have some ketones, and I go get up and I watch the sunrise. And as the sun's rising and it hits me, I feel that first alchemy card of the sun. 
I feel the awe. And this isn't all the awe. The all the awe comes. But um, it, I wanted to look this up, you know, so, so I, I could find it. Because there are gems. As, as um, Paul Selig states this, you know, there are gems in every religion. You just got to dig through the mountain to find them. Right. So Matthew 18, three says in the new international version, <laughs> truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what that means to me is trust, joy, play, curiosity, awe. Those are the things that I grabbed from that. And, uh, I stayed up, maybe had a little nap or meditation earlier. And as the, the night flows, we have our our one of our last dinners the next day we have our last dinner and we have this this fire where we all get to chop it up and trade war, war stories about our journeys and as it turns out uh, uh matthias had found a hummingbird that died and so in deciding what to do how to honor this animal rather than bury it we decided to make a pyre and burn it and the reason for that was when you bury something you anchor it to that position when you burn it you release it into the ether and we could all access the medicine of the hummingbird anywhere we are on earth, maybe anywhere we are in the cosmos. I'm sure that's already the case, but this uh, hummingbird was honored. It was wrapped in a blessed blanket from our guides, and we built a beautiful pyre, and we lit the hummingbird, and Aubrey gave a beautiful talk about the hummingbird from um, his uh, Native American spirit wheel was the bird of the north. And the North medicine is one of spirit. And the hummingbird drinks the nectar from the light of the sun through the flowers. It can move in all directions. And, um, you know, really this all coming full circle allowed to imprint on me something different about this hummingbird medicine, which was the joy, the play, the singing, the dancing, the curiosity, the awe. And that to me helped me find my balance point. Because uh, as Gaffney says, you know, the, the, the only, the only um, how does he say it? The only remedy for outrageous pain in the world is outrageous love. And previously, I've thought of that outrageous love as my love of family, my wife and my kids. And while that certainly has been a very good counterbalance to the shit that I see in the world and the pain and suffering that's in the world, it's not the only thing. It's not just how much I love them and how much they love me that balances that. It is the act of joy, the act of bliss, the act of laughing, singing, dancing. And that is a balance point to insanity and pain. It's not just love. It's the action of love, right? When we're in joy, we are in love. When we're laughing, we are in love. These things, and we could be in pain when we're laughing, but it cracks through the pain. And these are the things I experienced. I mean, we were, we were telling some pretty significant uh, experiences. And we're also busting each other's balls and laughing like crazy. And th th those, that was a really important part of the medicine journey for me as well was the recognition of that. Uh, God is happiest when his or her children are at play. That's, that's one that I continue to circle back on. My key takeaway, some of my key takeaways, you know, I had a lot on the body because of the fact that I was really, really recircling or circling back around on the nervous system. And, and uh, you know, ayahuasca is a great revealer. You know, it yanks back the curtain, whatever you got in the closet, whatever I have in the closet is going to reveal that to me. And a lot of what it was revealing to me was I've been training incorrectly. I talk all the time about Easy Strength by Pavel Tatsulin and Dan John, link in the show notes. And uh, I haven't been training that way because I haven't given myself five days a week to train. I'll just train once or twice, fairly heavy lifting, and um, go to boxing, those kind of things. And my body wasn't responding well to that. So circling back, I'm hitting the sauna every morning. I'm hitting my mobility every evening. If I get yoga and during the day, great, cool. I'm doing a lot of rehab on my left knee so I can get back on the mats and train in jujitsu. My wife and I went to this running seminar with uh, Dr. Romanoff, Pose Method. We'll link to that in the show notes. It is incredible. It's the first time I've ever run without pain. I was a 40, 41 years old. First time I've run without pain. And all of these things, you know, uh, for the mind, Ziva meditation, uh, focusing on energy systems. Am I in right relation with caffeine? Am I in my right relation with sleep when I'm going to bed at time? Uh, am I listening to a book that's keeping me up at night? Even if it's good for me and I love this book, do I want to stay up late to process and digest more information? Not right now. There may be a time where I want to rabbit hole more things and I need to at night, 
for right now, sleep and the restoration of my nervous system is most important. For me personally too, where's my downtime? The hermit is a big medicine card for me. Where, where do I find, uh, where can I escape? You know, it's funny. Uh, one of our guides, Will, was talking a lot about the archetype of Superman. And it's funny because that has been actually the forces, fortress of solitude has been one of the most resonant things of me, <laughs> with me on things that I need to fill my cup, the fortress of solitude. I got to spend time in the cave. And the cave for me might just be outdoors in nature, spending time with the trees, spending time with my chickens, whatever the case is. Um, how, do I, how do I check that box each day? How do I spend a little time with just me where I can clear my mind and circle back so that I can show up in the best way for my kids, for my work, and, and things of that nature? All of this is a part of the alchemy. You know, I can, I can talk about this shit all day long, uh, what my medicine was, but it's, it's the application of that and the integration, meaning habit change, that actually makes that real. And so what's been great for me as I reintroduce caffeine and different things, um, is that I can feel that very strongly. I can feel the difference in my body as strength slowly comes back, as my knee slowly stops hurting, as I'm doing these things, I just feel better and I operate better. And even if that only lasts for six months or a year, that's worth it to me. I'll go through hell to come back to a better reality that I see in the 3D. And it's certainly been my experience. Spirit, key takeaways on spirit. What reality tunnel am I living in? Uh, one thing I disagree with as I read through the Tao Te Ching is the thoughts on the world of 10,000 things. Uh, a lot of it contains the same illusory context as Maya in Hinduism, right? This is um, meant to be passed through, but not to meant to be taken seriously, to be in this world, but not of this world. Um, and and Czech says it best, in my opinion, it's not, it's not the illusion, it's the illusion. It is the grand design of the grand game of knowing thyself that we get to participate in. And while we shouldn't take it too seriously, and why I shouldn't take it too seriously, it's a little bit better there, so I'm not fucking preaching the gospel, I shouldn't take it too seriously. It still does exist. It still has consequence. There's still things that are worse than death. And at the same time, there's still things to love that are so fucking worth it. There's still a sweetness to life that is absolutely worth it that I love, that I could see myself playing in for eternity, not trying to surpass, not trying to get back to the center, not trying to give up everything to reemerge with the all. Maybe that happens in between each go. Um, but this place is fucking awesome. And it's so beautiful. And it's so worth us remembering our place in it so that we can be in harmony with it. And that's my focus personally through nature is how do I come back into right relation with all that is. Looking at Bizarro World, while I was out there, um, popped up in the Twitter feed, one of the largest dairy factories, I say factory, it was Factory Farm, one of the largest dairy operations in Texas, blew up. It had a fucking mushroom cloud explosion. 18,000 cows were burned alive or exploded. And I think one human. Reading the comment section, there's a lot of people talking about methane. <laughs> Read Sacred Cow or watch the documentary. Um, and there's no fertilizer in a place like that. This thing was blown the fuck up by someone, by human beings. A hundred, over 115 different food and meat processing centers in North America have gone up in flames in the last two years. I repeat that. Over 115 different meat and food processing centers in North America have gone up in flames over the last two years. If you look at any of these, they'll say under investigation. What they won't say is it was blown up. It was set on fire. It was burned to the ground by people. Now, I can speculate who might be doing this. If I look at uh, the largest farm owner in America during the egg shortage saying, don't worry, I've got soy-based eggs with 0% cholesterol and all this other bullshit fake food we want to feed you. Uh, the World Economic Forum, you know, saying we need to go to vertical farming through uh, fertilizers and water, uh, which does not regenerate the soil and does not sequester carbon. And we need to eat crickets as our protein and different insects because um, cattle, which have been around just as long as we have, are somehow ruining our environment. It's absolute nonsense. 
watch watch any one of the documentaries that I mentioned in the past, from Biggest Little Farm to Food Inc. to Sacred Cow to uh, what was the other good one? Ryland Englehart, Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground's got a, another one coming out this year called Common Ground. I'm gonna get Ryland back on before that releases. There we understand harmony in nature. There we understand carbon sequestration. There we understand regeneration, which feeds all things. Feeds the ground, increases the hummus, increases the soil capacity, increases the plant density, the grass density, increases the health of the animals, and increases the health in us in so doing so. I got to speak at a Force of Nature's event, What Good Shall I Do? Uh, recently after I got back and uh, on our panel for, with first year homesteaders, it was an awesome dude that I got to meet named Hobbs. He's in his fifth year, so kind of disqualified from first year homesteading, but I got to learn a lot from him and, and uh, he recommended a book. He's also a guy who understood the exact type of cattle we're running. Uh, I'll save that for the podcast, but really cool. So I started reading this book and I realized, holy shit, there's a ton of information here that actually matters. So I've highlighted some. Uh, in looking and out now, this is called man cattle and veld. And if you plan on getting into cattle or homesteading, highly recommend you get this book by Johann Zeitzman, but bear with me now. This isn't going to go totally cow talking. Uh, this is just, uh, some of the things that I see a lot of crossover between what he's saying with, with the bizarre world we live in constructive or obstructive. So the human mind is like a parachute. It only functions when open. That's not his quote, but he didn't quote it, but it is, that is true. Depending on our state of mind, thoughts and actions will be constructive or obstructive. Many factors determine this. He goes on. Prejudice and preconception. Man judges new concepts in the light of his perceptions. If an idea does not fit into his current frame of thinking, it is summarily rejected. He applies that further to cattle. Peer pressure. It takes strong character and a clear goal to swim against the current. Independent thinking makes this possible. Ding, 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 ding. I love this shit. Freedom to make mistakes. This is super important for parents. Without the freedom of making mistakes, progress would not be possible. Experience comes from trial and error. Mistakes have a way of highlighting a wrong idea. A mistake is only negative it is if it is repeated continually. I could keep going here, but I'm going to leave you with one last one. No one has a monopoly on the truth. Self-included. No one has a monopoly on the truth. The truth is not waiting to be invented by someone. Neither is it the domain of ordinary professors or even extraordinary professors and doctors of philosophy. The truth is part of creation with a capital C. Anyone with sufficient humility and hunger for the truth will find it. Man, I love that shit. As I mentioned, I think the alchemy of what we see in Bizarro World is, is what some people have tagged the Great Awakening, but I think it is more the Great Remembering. I think it is remembering the ways in which we lived on Earth in harmony with nature. Books like The Unlikely Peace at Kuchimakik by Martin Prechtel. If you like Audible, listen to it on Audible because he reads it, and he's phenomenal and poetic, and it is absolutely worth your time. Um, Ishmael, The Story of B, My Ishmael, Daniel Quinn, phenomenal novels and really connect us to mother nature, as Daniel put it, as opposed to mother culture. What else we got here? Dark Cloud Country by Daniel First Griffith. Not out on Audible yet. I imagine he will do an Audible for that, even though he self-published the book. Um, incredible, poetic, and necessary. We mentioned Lao Tzu's Daddy Ching, but from Ursula K. Le Guin, also awesome. And I'll leave out the, 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 the piece that I counter with that understanding of the world of 10,000 things is animism. It's my understanding that I can, I can witness the divine in all things, including people I don't like, but I witness the divine in all things, especially in nature. And John Lamb Lash really dives into this idea in Not in His Image. I've mentioned this book more than once on this podcast. Um, the creation story behind Sophia and all of the way the Gnostics perceived it that's written in the Nag Hammadi, cool beans. Like that, I'm not even attracted to that in the least bit after my experience in the Tao. <laughs> They're just like, all right, cool, another creation story. What happened in history with our understanding of, of alchemy and our relation to nature through initiatory experiences and through the keepers of said wisdom, that's the shit that I'm interested in. 
uh, the story that was told in replacement of animistic indigenous cultures throughout Europe. I'm interested in that. It's a fucking whole first third of the book is about that. Well worth your time. And perhaps most importantly is his connection of Sophia wisdom with Gaia theory. That the planet that we're on is a conscious, super conscious being. And that we can interact with that intelligence. That nature is intelligent. That there is an awareness, however small, in everything or large. That it exists in all things. Nothing is without. As Selig says, all is over nothing is. Those have been my visceral experiences that move beyond something that I've read. But when I read certain things that pair up with that, that lights a chord. And perhaps that is just a confirmation bias. But at the same time, the things that I'm, I'm feeling and witnessing on these medicines, um, they're beyond what's in the book. And I think that's an important thing for us to have for ourselves, whether that's through plant medicines or whether that's through a vision quest or the, or the darkness retreat or holotropic breathwork. Key ingredients here, as Paul and Hamilton really dive deep on, are who's in charge of that? Who's your guide? Who's your elder? And really syncing up there to make sure that you are left more whole than when you started. Love you guys big time. Uh, hopefully I balanced any inflammatory comments in the beginning with uh, uh, some ways in which I, I believe they may be true. And uh, hopefully there's something here that, that you continue to thread with. Um, many of these podcasts are lead-ups to the books that I've been reading. You know, they're, they're lead ups to dive deeper on your own and have your own alchemy, whether that's through the books or through your own journeys. Um, and that's how I hope, really hope that this podcast can help people is uh, continued education, not just from me as an educator or the guests that I have on, but like real education. Real education is done with your hands on the soil, it's done with your feet on the ground. As Daniel said, look down. <laughs> Where do you go next? And having that authority, the ability to self-author, to use Jordan Peterson's uh, terminology, to be the author of our own lives is one of the ways in which we pierce through the veil of why is this happening to me as opposed to what do I want to do now? It's certainly been um, a massive shift in my understanding of reality. Love you guys. Thank you to my sponsors. And uh, we'll see you next week.